Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you it sounds more like a fairy tale, siguro. Well, but uh, my family has always been known for eating well, even during the Spanish period. And uh, on my mother's side, the Imperial, they were mostly into Spanish food and uh, uh, the sophisticated taste. On the Tino side naman, they were more farmers. Ascenderos. They were actually Ascenderos. The Tinos were the biggest landholding family in the country until Landry Four came. <laughs> and uh, when I was a little boy, about grade two, if you didn't own 1,000 hectares, I considered you poor. <laughs> anyway, I... My, my grandmother was from a Kauaian Bulacan on the paternal side. And they cook very, very well. Tagalog food, ordinary food, but talagang masarap. And the, many of, their, of my relatives migrated to Peñaranda, Nueva Ecija, in the early days when the train to Nueva Ecija was built. That's why the food of Peñaranda is the best in Nueva Ecija. They have the best rich of sauce, the best putong puti, the best sapin sapin. Itsura lang yung sapin sapin ng Manolos. <laughs> and the one of Malabon, I cannot eat that as for the poor. Pampalengke. Anyway, uh, on the imperial side, my great grand, uh, my great grand parents, were very fond of eating. And my great grand uncle in the 30s would invite all his nephews and nieces in Legaspi for lunch, Sunday lunch. And all my grand uncles and grand, uh, you know, all those grand uncles and grand aunts, they haven't even started eating yet. They were already discussing next week's menu. <laughs> and then, uh, that uh, great grand uncle of mine, Lolo Elias, walang hindi sa anasikasa ko di pagkain. So, he was also very palikero beside so many illegitimate children. <laughs> and uh, his wife was so angry. And then uh, one time, she noticed he was looking after, there was a beautiful mestiza who was, had arrived in Legaspi. So in those days, they had no cars. So he was riding his horse, but he balanced it in front of the house of that woman. You know, make posing, trying to look, to see her, uh, if she was looking out the window. And the wife heard about it. So when he went home, they served the soup. In those days, nakaturin, diba? You always had uh, complete table settings with wine. My grandparents always ate the long plato, the plato with all the cutlery and uh, wine glasses. That was for every day. So when he opened the soup to read, there was his old shoe inside. Because <laughs> the wife was so angry. Anyway, he had, he had uh, and a lot of us, one of the legitimate children of my great, great grandfather. Uh, grew up with him, and she devoted her entire life cooking for him. And she was a good, good cook. I remember even as a child, and then she died. Every time there was a party, 110% attendance. Mm -hmm. I said the food was excellent. And I remember as a child, that was the first time I ate leche flan inside a calabasa. Mm -hmm. And it was cooked inside the calabasa. I remember, I could never forget this, and I tried making it. I was able to succeed a month, but it was not as nice as the one she made. Anyway, uh, I grew up in a house where we always had three cooks. Even, even today, my parents still had three cooks. And even if, when it was just my father living in Baguio, there were still three cooks. Now, one of the cooks has had a 
strokes or she's not she cannot cook anymore. She doesn't even remember the recipe, but she used to make many uh, several dishes. Each of them their own specialty. We are not like the Claparols, who in the 19th century they had one cook just making the dessert. Yon sa negros yon pero iba naman yung mga Claparols sa mga lakson. Iba yung lifestyle ng il negrense. Anyway, to the food. Uh, I, my first memory as a child was when I was two and a half years old. We were on a boat, a liberty ship, I found out later when I was grown up. It was a liberty ship, and we were on our way to Bicol. Uh, my mother was pregnant with my sister, and I remember climbing up all those uh, bunks, you know. There were mattresses, one top of the other. Uh, th those were the troop ships that, were, that brought the soldiers to Manila for liberation. And that was used as uh, inter-island boats after the war. It was December 1945. And I remember somebody gave me candied ginger. The first time I ever ate. That is the first food I remember eating in my life. Candy ginger. And it was so nice that every time I would hear about candy ginger, I would try it. But I never got to, to taste the same again. Anyway, when I got uh, later on, in, we were in Bicol, that's also the first time I saw a caramel <laughs> and sacks of rice. And uh, I wanted to ride a caramel, but they said, no, you can't do that because you'll get itchy. So, of course, I cried. <laughs> you know, I was very spoiled. I was the eldest, and the eldest grandchild. So, when we got back to Manila, uh, I remember after the war, we had a chef who had a talk. They wore talks, and they spoke Spanish. And they would always go in the morning, they will ask Mama, Senora, que quieres comer para, para hoy? So she will tell them what to cook, you know. And uh, when they were cooking, you could not play in the kitchen. So because they would get mad, you know. <laughs> not like today. The kitchen is the family room, diba? But in those days, children were always with the yayas. And uh, I don't remember, I, I, we, we had midwives. I remember uh, during liberation, when we went to be caught, my mother had three babies. I was two and a half. My sister was uh, two, uh, one, one something, and my cousin was a baby. And we had three midwives. My mother was very spoiled. I was also very spoiled. I was born in Hospital Espanol de Santiago in Makati in 1943 because that was the only hospital with an air-conditioned room <laughs> in the whole Philippines <laughs> and my mother stayed two weeks in the hospital I was the eldest and I was also the eldest grandchild so when my Lolo came back from abroad uh, he was the first ambassador to Rome to Bangkok and to Indonesia so he stayed with us uh, when he came back. So we had this long, long table. Uh, it's the one in Baguio that you have seen. And uh, he would sit at the cabecera. I was the only grandchild to eat with the grown-ups. So my Lola sat at the head. I sat beside him. My Lola across. Then my father. Then my mother. Then my uncles and aunts. By age. I was the only grandchild that sat beside my Lolo. And every time he would drink wine, I would also have my little liquor glass of wine. And the same with Papa. If Papa will drink beer, I will have a little glass of beer. I was that spoiled. And then at the age of about eight years old, they opened New Europe in uh, Sakara. The first good 
gourmet restaurant in Manila. And uh, we used to eat there quite often. So as a little boy, I was eating Chateaubriand with Bernays. I was eating chicken a la cake. Those were my favorites. And baked Alaska. And then sometimes, I, since I like cream, I would order Irish coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked the cream. I didn't like the coffee because it's a pain because it's my whiskey. But when I was around 10, Papa started drinking Gimlet. You know, the gin, uh, Gordon's gin or Tanqueray gin with lime juice, rose lime juice. And he would put on Gostura bitters and a Maraskin of cherry. And he had this big, big cocktail glass. So I would be the one making his cocktail. So, siempre. <laughs> so while you're mixing the cocktail, I grind the, the ice, they had the ice grinder. It was a big, big cocktail glass. So I put the, the ice, I put the gin, I put the, the rose lime juice, and then I put the cherry. And while putting the cherry, I eat two. And then after I mix everything, I take a sip of the gin. So when I was 10 years old, I was drinking Gimlet every night. But I got one or two sips now. So I never got drunk. Anyway. Uh, when I was in third year high school, <coughs> Papa told me, Sunny, I want you to go to Palawan. We have 1,000 hectares there. To give you an idea of how big 1,000 hectares is, in Tramuros, the whole old city is only 60 hectares. So I said, I want you to go there and bring people to develop the land. Because they had acquired the land in the early 50s, and then he left it. So it had practically abandoned it. No? So I want you to develop it because that will be yours. So he gave me, uh, I said, but I have no money. I was only third year high school, 15 years old. I was having a balance But uh, I will give you an encargado to, who will know agriculture. I didn't know anything about agriculture. No? I was always senorito. And then my idea of going to the Hacienda was going there and then riding those big horses and racing the bus as they go along the highway. That was what I used to do. I never used to go to the field. So I didn't know anything. But then I'll give you an encargado. He will tell you what to do, but you run everything. So, sige. I remember at that time, 1959, there was only one bank in the whole in Puerto Princesa. There was no road going south. And this was south of Brooks Point. Brooks Point was the next biggest town, which is about 200 kilometers from Puerto. And then the Hacienda was about 35, 40 kilometers. Now in the highway it's 35. But no arrow, there was no road. So you had to walk the trail. And if it was bad weather, you know, before the fastest way to go was but banca. But bad weather, you could not, you could not use the banca. So you have to walk. And I walked that. Wow. You know, but you know, in Manila I never walked. <laughs> I was so spoiled. And then on the thing done, he said, you have to no, he said, you have to get tenants to farm the land. So with this encargado, I went first to my uncle. I said, how do you pick a good tenant? Imagine, 15 years old, you have to get farmers, convince them to go to Paduan and, and, and uh, farm. I said, but I don't know how to choose. So you look at, my uncle told me, you look at their surrounding, the house, if it is clean, if there are plenty of plants, flowers and fruits and vegetables. That means we are industrious. If the lot, if the lot is dirty, uh, full of grass and weeds, that means they're lazy. Don't get them. 
you know, I had to, I had to explain the contract. And it was all in Tagalog. <laughs> alam mo nung araw, di ba? Pag may English tayo sa Lasal, walang alam ng Tagalog. And ang lalim-lalim ng mga contracts, the third contracts. And then you had to convince them to move from their Mesiha to Palawan. Because they didn't know anything about it. And Palawan was, you know, like jungle. There was, there was malaria, there was and cerebral malaria, not ordinary yeah. malaria. And then there was the, the fame of Iwahik Penal Colony with the thousands of convicts. And then in the south, with the Muslim. And at that time, all the Christians were afraid of the Muslim. I remember. <coughs> so I had to go from one hacienda to the other in the Brazil and try to convince them to go to Palawan by offering them all the land they wanted to till. Because in the haciendas, they could get, if they're lucky, two to three hectares. No? But if there's plenty of children, if they go to Palawan, they can farm even 10, 20, because I had a thousand hectares. No? So whatever you want. So finally, I was able to bring 100 families. Now, that was, I remember Papa and I, we used to, in those days, you could not buy anything in Palawan. There was nothing there but beer. Palawan at the time, until the, until martial law, was the biggest consumer of San Miguel beer in the whole country. The government people would go to the restaurant and order isang beer na. That means one case. <laughs> so, makita mo beside the table, cases and cases of beer. But then, two beers, that means two cases of beer. And that's what they do. Wala magawa. Drink and drink and drink. So, I had to, you, I had to prepare. Because with 100 families, we were going to a place that there were no houses, no electricity, no water. It was just land, no? So, we had to bring everything. We had to buy uh, banit, kumut, clothes, food, uh, barbed wire, nails, everything. Everything for building a house, for fencing, for eating, caldero, kawali, bago, kasi men, from Ilocano, origin. So, bago, so we have to buy one drum, <laughs> 200 liters of bago. And then we have to buy bring salt, sugar, rice, everything. Para yung talagang uh, pioneer, pioneer, moving, bringing everything. And then I was in charge of the medicine. At that time, I think my uncle was in Sterling Laboratories. Lean Imperial, who became president of UNILA. So I had boxes and boxes of medicine. So for all kinds of sickness. So, and then, so we boarded the boat. We practically occupied the whole boat. At that time, they had this slippery ship still being used as inter-island boats. And they were really filthy. Usually one bathroom and then they had what they call first class and second class. The second class, yung teheras lang, you know, the folding cuts that was just uh, all over the place. Now, the first class, you had cabins, but they were so cramped. But then, at least you had privacy. Sometimes, I think, I think we were two in a cabin, something like that. And then we all, uh, those in the cabins, ate in the cafe. So I remember that. And then uh, eating with the captain, and I was sitting there where the, in front of the pilot deck because I brought along a whole maleta of books. And I remember my baboon was one kilo of chapoy, <laughs> one box of, uh, one can of fita, fita biscuits. No, Aaron, that was the only biscuits you could buy. And cans and cans of guava jelly. Because those were the only things you could buy in those days. This was 1959. Wow. 
Wala pa yung mga what you could buy now at the groceries. Wala pa yan. Although, they had a lot of imported uh, Australian people already in the 50s. I remember when I was in uh, high school, my bao was always Australian tender you know, sandwich in Patisal. That was cooked with bistec style. You know, my mama would buy that imported Australian tender, you like know, titim lang ng toy of calamansi, and then you have pandesal with plenty of butter, and that was the sandwich. And I remember some of my classmates would steal my bowl, but then sarap sarap daw. And ako naman, I got so tired of it, I would exchange it naman with the bowl of you know, butch pennies. Kasi his auntie, who was, was the owner of El Comedor, they were related to us. She cooked very well, and she made the best chicken sandwich. It's sure lang ng, ng uh, Milky Way. <laughs> sarap sarap na chicken sandwich nila. So mag-exchange ako ng tenderloin sandwich for chicken sandwich. Pero pumisan, what usually happened, my classmate would steal some of my baong. And that was my recess. My recess baong or merienda. Like that. Anyway, when I got uh, my mother was opposed to the idea of my going to Palawan. I was 15 years old. Uh, and then, siguro, kada dakdak niya, nakonsensya yung papa ko. So, you know, the boats before would start in every port. The first port in San Jose, Mindoro, then I think it was Coron or Cuyo, then Coron, then Culio, and then every port going to Puerto Princesa. It took about a week. Oh and then by the time, we entered the port of Puerto Princesa. There was this coast guard, navy boat coming, and went up the ship and asked, who is Mr. Tino? So the captain pointed to me. I said, so the, the navy man said, the governor wants to see you. So I joined the him in the boat, and the, they brought me to the pier. It was beautiful. Puerto Princess at the time, it was uh, summer, and the Palawan cherry was in bloom. So you know the pier before, Mataas uh, town, and it was full of Palawan cherry. It was beautiful. I could never forget that. Palawan cherry in bloom. I don't know why they don't plant it here. It's such a beautiful tree. Anyway, I was brought to the brought to the governor's mansion, and then my father was there. Apparently, my mother got, did, did not stop nagging, so he took a navy boat from Manila, went direct to Puerto, and then since he knew French name that door, when I reached the governor's mansion. The entire provincial government was there. The judge, the fiscal, the provincial commander, the station, everybody, the doctor, they were all there. It was out the top of the town. Imagine a 15 year old bringing 100 families to settle uh, on the Sierra. It was the top of the town. So I was introduced to everybody. Dr. Kipley, who was the, is related to the to the Tiras. You know, when the Holo Sultanate had carried on rivalry, the ones who, the, who lost were the Narasi, and they all moved to Peruan. Na iwan sa Holo, yung mga Tiras. Arya na isaping that in England, and I was supposed to go to England the next year to study. So I was telling you, if you, when, if you go to England, there's a house in London, and you know, that you must have a good one who was head of Sabah, mm. Sabah. So back to when I went to Sabah in the, in the 70s, uh, we were entertained by his wife. I, I used to go to Sabah with the, with the barker trader. I will go to Sabah with my passport so I could eat different food. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's far ahead. Anyway, when I got to Palawan, we had to take the boat again to Brooks Point. Siguro ilang stops, two or three more stops. So several days, 
Metro Group's point, we had to unload in a big, big, uh, several big bunkers to go to the Marangas, where the Hacienda was located. Then I, I remember we arrived uh, past midnight, and we didn't know where to go. But there was a school, and there was the uh, principal's house. So I was booked in the house of the principal, who was uh, on vacation, in the summertime. And then all the, men, the people were divided among the classrooms. No? We unloaded everything on the beach. At that time, all the, all the villages, the barangays, were all by the sea. Because the sea was the only means of transportation. Banca, no? So the next day, he said, nah, that is comfortable to my house. Then he said, where's the bathroom? No bathroom. <laughs> I've never been in a house without a bathroom or a toilet. So I said, where's the toilet? That is there. It's a, it's a school. So I went, it's like a, a hut. Then for possible, my God, it was a pit full of ooh. And the bath, the bath, I said, what? I cannot do that. Imagine, Sunday, Kasa. All the nice piece of Manila, and then you will go to a place where there was no toilet, no running water, and that. My God, what will I do? So, I'm going to go to the tools, no, pala, pico, everything. Bigger up in the roll, you know, the, the home. So, I go down, may the lap of the roll, may the lap of the tabo, may the lap of the bowl, may the lap of the toilet paper, I dig a hole, may poo poo. <laughs> Every day, different holes. So I was fertilizing the ground around the... <laughs> That was the lifestyle. And then, and then, food. Food was the problem. Because imagine you're feeding 100 families. Although I did bring uh, canned food, you know, uh, sardinas, you know, before the sardinas, the big cans, the food. Portola, Rose Bowl, those are very good chapters. You can't find them now. Now you find those little sardines that don't taste as good. But in those days, the sardines were big, oval cans. And that was very nice for Binabagyo, right? Make this up. Anyway, we had bongo, but then you get tired of eating those things, no? So, late, I know, the first day, just uh, by getting to know the place, we found out there were no stores. They only had weekly, like a changge, what they call tambo. The, the natives come from the mountains bringing kamote or whatever they can find. And that is, and then they have those mga kakani, no muslim, mga fried, uh, fried kakani, and then mga gabi. At that time, I used to eat only meat, chicken. Because, you know, when I was 10 years old, the only thing I knew how to cook was filet mignon <laughs> or, or fruit salad. I didn't know. I would eat salad, you know, like the And then there was not too much of that then. Wala pa yung mga sabagyo no araw na, na marami. All the good I before was what the pet chai, ula pang masadong chicharo nun eh. Upo, upo, pet chai. Yan ang mga gulay ng araw pang kong, di ba? In the 50s. Kaya mas suwerte kayo you can eat anything now. But anyway, in Palawan, it was summertime. So pag summertime na lang, walang gulay. Kasi nothing grows. So you could not eat. Talang forced to eat whatever was there. So finally, we, start on a, we started opening the land, no? choosing where we would build the house. But we went there, and they bought a horse for me, and then they assigned a, like an old lady from Peñaranda, <coughs> whose son was a very good cook, and she, she, was, she was telling me stories that after the uh, 
during the Philippine-American War. Uh, they were always talking about the Makabebe, how afraid they were of the Makabebe. And then, when her husband died, she went, she, she was into making kakanin. So she be, became like my yaya, to wash my clothes, cook my food. So I was assigned to stay in the house of a former encargado of ours, who already had a homestead near the farm, several kilometers of within. So while the others were building their house, I was staying there. So when we went first to, to reconnoiter the hacienda, we saw huge uh, areas of giant bamboo, hectares and hectares and hectares, and hectares and hectares of papaya, the native papaya, the small one. Ang tamis tamis. Because apparently the birds eat them, then make poo poo, and then they just grow. So there's plenty of papaya, really, really sweet. So what I would do, because uh, they didn't have much food also when I was staying. They had a little, uh, little talong, little this, but not enough. They had a family, and I remember, you know, the nearest rice mill was about 20 kilometers away. So we had to make bayo, <laughs> the, the rice, every day. So I learned how to, do you know, to make bayo, but I never learned how to. How to win? But that's a good way to learn. So maybe it's a good way to learn. So at least I learned something. And then the first week, I remember, dining papaya. So breakfast, ripe papaya, lunch, nilaga papaya, dinner, binatangan papaya. But then, then another sardinas na may papaya. Every lahat ng paisip. That's where I learned how to eat vegetables because there was nothing to eat. So, pupunta ako sa tabo. There was a day assigned for the tabo, for the sangge. So, nakuha ko yung nandang, kain ko yun, all these kakanins. And then this old lady who used to do kakanin as a life field, I told her, you make kakanin. So, every day, she would make from scratch. Yeah, suman. Suman sa liya. Gagawin mo pa yung liya. So I learned how to make liya. Oh, yeah. Then sapin sapin. Then suman na kamoting kahoy. I remember I used to make later on, I would make suman na kamoting kahoy. Isang sako. Yeah. I, up to now, I know how to make that. Yan sapin sapin, I know how to make. I learned how to make espasol, the real espasol from, from Peñaranda, ang masarap, lalo na pag may kundol. Pero ang hirap, hirap, you know, magkakaalmuragas kasi sa, sa kagawin na. Because the, as, as it gets thicker and thicker, the, the paleo, the, the kawali goes with it. But the one made really in Peñaranda is really, really good. And the one that's making it, Nagkarla, Kilalaya, those are my relatives who had married me. They're from Nervesia who had settled mm -hmm. in Nagkarla. The one that you buy mm -hmm. in Nagkarla mm -hmm. is a Nervesia. It's a soul. Anyway, when they were building their house, Along the way, sometimes you pass uh, places that the Palawan had lived before, and sometimes you will find those uh, pinagbahayan nila, mga wild tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Later on, I found out they were cherry tomatoes. Nung nauso na sa Baguio, but I remember in the 1950s, ay kamati sa lahat pero sa pangbisa. Kasi otherwise, pag hindi sa kabawa si Kuyas lang, walang kamatis, hindi mas sarap, di ba? So, yan. Inaantay namin yung mahinog. And then pag wala, wala kang, sometimes wala kang kain, we would dump the creeks. Mga bato. Tapos kakapain mo yung mga bato. May mga hipon. Saka little fish. And then, 
you will just make that parang pangat, no? Pero bukulan lang, whatever. And then on moonless nights, yun ang masaya. Pag moonless night, you have a, what you call this, Petromax, the Petromax lantern. We go to the beach, naka-swimming trunks ka, may dala kang gulo, then somebody's carrying the Petromax, and then all the fish come to the shore. Ikaw naman, pag makita mo, tuk, tuk, so you never get the whole fish, you get bits and bits of whatever it is that was swimming there. But at least, meron kang kakainin for several days, kasi you can easily get one lot, uh, one balde of whatever. That, because they're all attracted by the lights, so they can't, but you never get to eat a whole fish. Because they're all just tinataga ang ganyan. Pero masaya siya. Pero masaya. That's the number. Moonless lights lang yan. And then, pag may, may panaw naman, sabi nila, Oy, may pawikan. You know, the turtle. Ay, naku. Piesta. I will buy the whole pawikan. You know, one tanggana was 20 pesos. But you must remember at that time, the salary of the, of the laborer was 40 pesos a month. 40 pesos a month. And then, one per week, Langana District was 20 pesos. And I remember, we used to buy uh, labuyo, you know, the wild chicken, 50 centavos. At that time, the chicken was 2 pesos. But the labuyo was 50 centavos for. And also, the, the pawika, I would slice it, salt it, hang it in bamboo, air dry it. Masarap. And uh, later on, in the 60s na, the mid-60s, I would make turtle steak a la creme. <laughs> With cream sauce na. <laughs> turtle steak, it was like veal, you know. Did you buy it live or? No, you buy them na uh, katay na. Katay na. Saya na, I could. I never thought of buying the chef. Malalaki. Malalaki. Anyway, <clears throat> ganyan yung buhay ng araw. Then, they, they had to build a dam. Uh, they chose a, a street, a river that was not, a stream that was not so, so big to dam it. And even if the dam was an earth dam, only seven feet high, and maybe only about this big, we were able to irrigate over 100 hectares with that. The water was so good, and the soil was so beautiful, you know. I never saw soil like that. The topsoil was three meters. Three meters of topsoil. And then, one day, I was walking by the dam. I saw something this big floating. I said, what is that? What is that? What is that? So they caught it. It was a shell, a clam. I never saw a coal because wala namang coal sa Manila nung araw. Wala yung Japanese snail, di ba? So it was this big. And I remember, there were two of it, and they cooked it, and I ate one, and I was busug with one, one coal. It was good, it was good. But it was, but you know, nobody had seen it. So, it got to be very big. I never saw Kuhul that big again, as big as my fist. Anyway, then Sigina, whatever, whatever I could find, say in the wilds, you can find some vegetables na, na growing sa mga ruins, yung mga pinagbahayan, na they might have dropped some seeds or whatever. And the one time, I remember, I was walking, there was this huge tree. There was a huge bunch of fruit that looked like grapes. And it was grapes. Wild grapes. Pero ganyang kalaki. Yung bunch, it was one langana. And medyo maasin. But it was grapes. I don't know how it ever got there. It was growing. There was a tree. Growing like that. You know, tagulat ako kasi 
I never saw grapes that even in my imagination or in the movies, wala namang gan, ganyang kalaki eh. No? Hindi mo mabuhay. So of course, I made grape jam. <laughs> Alam mo ko, basta, well, I will never throw anything away. I learned how to, living in Palawan, I learned how to economize and, and save and recycle and cook and everything. And then, uh, and then one time, I remember, by parang years time, mga kenat, they had meat. I don't know where they got it. And then the baby cows down. So, bam, sarap, not cooking again. It was only later, I think the following year, that I found out that it was dog. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I ate dog. And I enjoyed it. Actually, later on, uh, when I came back after Europe in the, in the kailan ba yung, 60. mga late 60s, I had this craving for dog when I was there. And every week, we would look around for dogs. Okay, ginagawa ko, yung mga baka ng mga kaaway namin, we will find where it is. And in the evening, we shoot it, and bring it home, and I would slaughter it and cook the whole cow overnight. I would make corn beef, paklengua, uh, I would even make uh, yung, nahanap ko yung, what you call this? Kambesa de Yung chicks, sweet breads. Ah, sweet breads. I don't know what sweet breads is in Tagalog. I would make that with cream sauce. Okay. And I would make that with cream sauce. And then, you know why? Because I had cream. 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 And then in a while, because I had cream, because you could order everything from Saba, from Borneo. Then people, the Muslims would go bring, bring a copra, and then you would give at least I need whiskey, the little, because free trade, don't it? Whiskey, chocolate, whatever. So I just give at least. So every time somebody goes to Borneo, to collect mo ano na yung order mo. So I have whiskey, man. I was in the Hacienda. I have whiskey, I have peaches, canned peaches, chocolate, all of, the, all of those things. So, I didn't have to go to town. I go to town only for whatever rice, or whatever coffee, or everything else from, from Saba. And then, uh, but later, later, life improved. Because we already had it. Tractors we could go, you know. Although I used to walk, still walk, uh, that four thirty four kilometers. Pero ano na? Nasaray na rin ako. In the beginning, since I did not know how, I really did not walk. Every creek I would pass, I would take a bus. <laughs> Every creek. So imagine. Ilang creeks yan, kasi pinapawisan ako, so maliligo ako. At ay paligo ko, hindi naman pwede yung buhus-buhus lang. Nagsasabon ako. So maliligo, ilang beses ka magsasabon. Later on, in the, yung just before Marshall, no? yung sanay na sanay na ako, pag naglala ka na po, pag pagod na ako, tayo na lang ako sa lupa. Nasanay na ako. I, that's why, you know, from the very spoiled brat, I, I learned how to live the way the farmers live, the lower classes, and then you know, when I was there, pag nag even as, at 15 years old, pag nag yung mag -asawa, I was the one inter intervening, I was the guidance counselor. <laughs> if anybody got sick, I was the one prescribing medicine. <laughs> and then I was also the, the, what you call this, the cashier. You know, my father, I was bringing with me at the time, I don't know how many thousands of pesos in cash. Because there was no bank. Everything had to be in cash. I had a maleta, a taxi case, full of cash. And the one time, I remember the first time I walked from the tax, the Brooks Point, and then to the next fire trading station, Malis, which was about 20 kilometers. We had to stop there because I wanted to drink cold coke. It was the only store that had uh, what do you call this? Gas, gas press. 
So he went there, and then, Panay Muslim. At that time, lahat ng mga kasama ko from the South, they were all afraid of the Muslim. Kasi daw yung mga Muslim, huwag ka daw kakain sa bahay nila. Kasi yung bigas, nilalagyan ng bubog, or bamboo shavings, you're going to die. Pero ako naman, I like to try anything. So I would eat if they offered me, but my, my companion, they would not touch the food. Pero ako, I, anything new, I would eat. That's why I learned how to drink the Muslim coffee, the one they put cinnamon bark. When they boil the coffee, they add bark of cinnamon, which is actually the second class cinnamon. That is the cinnamon that was first exported by, by Legaspi to Acapulco. That, uh, you know, with that second class cinnamon that you find in Mindanao, they, Philip II recovered all the expenses of all the expeditions that were sent to the Philippines from the time of Manchela and made money in the process. Ganong kamahal ang cinnamon ng araw sa, sa Europe. But then, that's why, even during the time I was there, I would buy cinnamon. Cinnamon bar. Yeah. And then even, I remember, a couple of years ago, I was cleaning my cabinets. I found I still had the whole, whole basket of cinnamon bar. But that is the second class cinnamon, not like the ones you find in Indonesia. Anyway, <clears throat> yung mga, nakita ko yung Muslim, tapos sabi nung, nung isa, oh, ito yung anak ng milyonaryo. Imagine, naglalakad. Ano? Ihahatid ko na ikaw doon sa Marangas. Marangas was the town. His house was in Itogbong, the, not town, the barrio before. So, sama ka na sa akin. I was so afraid. Kasi the first time, masasama ako sa Muslim. Eh baka patayin ako, di ba? Eh, teenager ka. Anyway, pagdating ko, akit na sa uh, compete, they call it. The first thing I did was throw the money on the floor. Para as if it was nothing. But it was all cash. And then, I remember yung nakaprint doon, but kung ano I don't know how much it was. But they were stacks and stacks of bills. And then, uh, para as if it was nothing, I threw it on the floor. And then, nakaganyan lang ako. Then, pagdating doon sa, sa bahay niya, he invited me for coffee. Then I saw this beautiful Qing Dynasty jar. It's still in my house. And he just put, was putting sugar in it. And you know, I remember it was white. So he was beyond in white way. So Dynasty, it was not mahal. So I was a little bit. I was a little Then after about 13 years or something, he gave it to me. Kasi binubwisit doon sa ng mga hente. So you get it na. It's yours na. Then, when I found, when I got it, it was celadon with white. Four seasons. And then the top had the tiger. You know, I, I bought it a seat in the bus, a seat in the plane. And it's still there in my house. Because at that time, it was already worth two thousand dollars in the antique shop in Manila. What more growth, di ba? And he gave it to me gratis at the morning. Anyway, pinatid niya ako sa senda, on the baka. Malaking, malaking baka. That uh, there was a transportation of mga Muslim, either a horse or a, or a big uh, bull. It was a bull. Big, big one. And then, yeah, doon ako sa bahay niya. That's where I started learning how to eat Muslim food. Because the first thing they do when you enter the house is to offer you coffee, the Muslim coffee. And then they offer you kakanin, na masarap din, because the, although these are mostly fried, the butter is made with gata. So pagkain mo, malinang na. Actually, even now when I go to Paluan, I always tell his son, his son is now a counselor. Patay na yung friend ko. I said, Oy, patagal na ako hindi nakapapay. 
So he orders his family to make for me. And you know, they last for months. Maski may data. You just put it in a car and it lasts for months. Ang sarap sarap kasi malinam na, di ba yung data? It's fried. It's like a... May mold yan eh, parang di ba yung parang bulaklak? Ah, okay. Yung didip nila gano'n, yes, and then yes. they cook it in, mm. in, in mantika. Mm, yeah. Until it flows and separate. It's very delicious. Oh, Ang hindi ko na masyadong nagustuhan, yung mga ulam ng Muslim. Except for once. Because once I got lost walking. Gutom na gutom na ako. Eh, nung araw, maraming koko. So, kung hindi namin tayo ng debate, it's all for good night. And I was lost. I was walking for about two hours. And then I saw a hat. And then when I went, I knocked. He was pala one of my laborers. And then he... he it was noon time na. Kaya gutom na gutom na ako. So he invited me to eat. So we ate on the floor. Yung bamboo floor. Sa losa. And then he served me this. Salakito na inihaw pagkatapos niluto sa gata na may duyang dilaw na malapot na malapot yung gata and then with the hot rice and then you sprinkle the rice with salt and then you ay, it was heaven I must have eaten a whole bowl of rice and you know, I never ate as good as that and that was just one hat in the middle of the coconut field. And I never forgot it because it was so delicious. I don't know if it was a good one, and I tried making it. But it never came out as nice as that one. Because it was the one that 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 was the one. And then can you imagine? I tasted something similar to that, but not anyhow in Karamoan. When the vice mayor invited me, he was a distant relative, invited me to his house, and he served me parrot fish cooked in gata with, uh, you know, pakpo. Pakpo. Pakpo, sarap sarap din. Anyway, that is the type of, well, that, uh, the food that you, you learn to eat when you have nothing yes. available. You have, to, you have to eat whatever is there. And because of that experience, I learned how to eat anything. And even now, uh, ever since then, wherever I go, wherever I go, if I see something strange, that is what I will eat. I will go. Fast forward, no? We had a lagging concession in Palawan. It was 50,000 hectares. And within that lagging concession was the Tabon Cave. And uh, Bob Fox, at that time, he had a commit who claimed she was a relative. Sikoni. Sikoni. Because she was a de la Fuente. And my uncle had married a de la Fuente. You know the the father of the major of Trinidad, the father of Trinidad, was a de la Fuente. And uh, one of my aunties was a de la Fuente, so she was claiming she was sort of related to us. And she was from San Miguel. And you know, San Miguel, they cook very, very well. And she really cooked well. And so my father liked staying with them because she would cook uh, native food na masarap. And then Bob Fox liked having my father around because my father had cases and cases of whiskey, brandy, every day before lunch and before dinner, cocktail time, and Bob was a laplaquero. So we, we were staying in Bob Fox's house in Quezon, which was actually inside our logging concession. And then one time he said, Boy, there are oysters. I said, oh, that's right. Then I said, what's the color? I said, I couldn't even eat it. Because I didn't know how to eat it. 
And then when they opened it, you could not open it. We were using anong tawag ba yung barreta. 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 So we were using a barreta. Ang hirap yun lang. So what I did, I said, ah, put it on the fire. So it opened by itself. And because it was this big, it was so disgusting because you could not, you know, the oysters were served, you saw this one get to slice it. And it was really happy. It was really good only for making oyster sauce. <coughs> Anyway, that, uh, that, that was in near the Tavern Cave, right behind the Tavern Cave, that's where, that's where they found it, very near the house. And then later, I would also, when I already had a house in the farm, not any farm, I would go to Tavern to what's that island, okay, so with the bird, the bird Ursula, Ursula Island, the bird sanctuary. I would go there with a Muslim diver and then a uh, Masayista. I always said a Masayista wherever I go. And then I had a, a policeman, bodyguard, and, and somebody to shoot. Because Ursula Island was the nesting place of birds. And at 5 o'clock in, in the afternoon, the place becomes dark with thousands of birds coming in to, rock, to roost. And then in the evening, when they're all sleeping, you get this big stick and you throw it up the tree and a bird will fall. A bird will fall. And then I used to... It was like a small chicken. It's a wild pigeon, but big, big breast, full of fat. And then we just uh, remove the feathers and then salt and pepper, and then eat Yahweh. I have it. That's one thing I want to eat again. And then, you know, it was so juicy and tender. And then, the diver, in the daytime, I would go snorkeling, and you could get taklobo, the giant clam, but we get the small ones. And then this one also, you throw it in the fire to open, then you slice it, then you put calamansi, very nice pollutant with whiskey, and I know. I would, I would cut there for two days. And then the Muslim diver, you, he could get lobsters at six feet of water. Talaga. Mm -hmm. And ako what I would do with the lobster, I just throw the whole thing in the fire, live. And then the moment the the shell turns black, you remove it, the inside is matasado. So, I would, it was very tender, very juicy, and then I always have patis, calamansi, and butter. Parang lemon butter with patis. Kaya mas masarap yung gawa ko kaysa yung lemon butter sa America. And that's how I would eat my lobster. Wala lang kanin niya. Lobster in that. At one time, he caught a lobster that was so big. Because my favorite part ko was the head. Because I really dissect the head. And this lobster was so big, it took me four days to eat the head. Wow. But I was eating it all the way to the lava. Even in Buksuk. You know, Buksuk is where they have jewel there. Pearl Farm now, but at the time, I would go there looking for antiques, and then while the boat was was uh, dark, the water was so clear, we would go on hand like fishing, and then you bring out the line, and you can see the fish bite, then chook, you know, you see him, you can see even 20 feet, the water was so clear, although I had not been back there since 19, since martial law. And uh, ganun ang kwan. Pero pag may nabalita, may, may event ng Muslim. You know, they have this, uh, what they call it? Circumcision. And yeah, kasal. Those are big, big affairs. The moment I hear of something like that, I will go. Kasi I never saw those things. And then sigurado maraming pagkain, maraming strange food. So one time, I traveled to 
Rio Tuba. And that is where they have the mine now, the Rio Tuba mine. But in those days, was that because there was a wedding which took the office and the half hour, and got in a book of time, ceremony, but pintura, pintura, and all of that. And then yung mga, all these traditions which I never seen. So I would make it a point to go to those places to learn and see what they were like. And that's how I learned. And that's how my experiences with Palau, that were they're all here in my mind. And Palau at that time was so pristine that when I was studying in Europe, but winter, when every, every time I feel homesick, I look at my picture of Palawan and I would cry. <laughs> I was so homesick. I think it was winter, so winter, everything is so great. And then you look at it, it was so green and nice and so on. So, yan ang mga, mga pangkusat sa Palawan. Well, at least I, I survived. I survived on, on whatever food was there and I learned how to eat anything. That's why. Kakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakak
it's not as good as the sirloin in Europe. Parang dito napaka second class, no? Fifth class, hindi mo makahe. Anyway, so I, since that was the only class I knew how to buy, that was what I would buy. And record, sirloin. So I could finish and remember my dinners. Because if you eat in this uh, cafe near the school, at that time you pay. With two marks. I think it was five francs or something like that. <laughs> and we had five course meal. When I was like five, five francs, I remember, because no araw, I always had 1,000 francs reserved for emergency. Na ano, eh, ko iniisip ko, 250 dollars pala yun yung araw. Eh, pag nawawalan ako ng barya, ibabayad ko. Hindi nila masukli, ah, I have to wait until the next day for the supply. And then yung mga wine, the French wines were only one franc. Yeah, mga rosé d'anjou, yung lahat ng mga grab, all those all those wines that we buy now with hundreds and thousands of pesos were only one franc, which was 90 centavos at that time. Kaya hindi ako nag-iisip ng pera because my father had to deposited $20,000 in the bank for me for an emergency. So pag wala akong magawa ng kabiyahe, oh, di ba? We used to have, we used to go to Schaffhausen to eat steak. We go to Le Constance to eat merienda. And then one time, I told my Brazilian classmate, you know, I've not eaten fresh ribs for a long time. Because in Switzerland, everything was kind or bottled. Yung mga hipon, balat na. Wala, hindi ka makakain ng halabos. Eh, iba na ka ng halabos, di ba? I said, let's go to Venice. So, we drove to 500 kilometers to go to Venice. Then, for the thing that we brought, we stayed in a hotel, and then we asked the concerns, where's a good place to eat? So, he recommended this restaurant. The food was so good. We ate there for three days. Lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner, lunch. And then, after many, many years, when I had come, siguro the 70s now, they featured the 10 best restaurants in Europe. And that was one of them. And then there was another feature in that uh, article. In, uh, it was in Zurich. And we used to eat there every month. Basta dumating na yung alawas. Kasi masarap yung pagkain. And then, alam mo nung araw, when you, in Europe, you have to dress up after six. If you go up after six, you have to have dark suit, silk tie, and then if we will eat in a good restaurant, we will have diamond, uh, stars, cupcake, and then tatawa yung today, it's a bit in German. This is the Philippine ambassador calling. Pero maganda mesa mo. Philippine ambassador calling. So siyempre pagdating doon, lahat sila bata ko, ang pagkuha mo ng mga waiter. Kaso, Yes, so, ngayon, hindi mo magawa yun. Parang, ano, ang tusutusan lang sila. In Paris, when you go to Paris, the first thing they look at you is your watch. And then, your pen. That's why they have yung mga patik Philip, tsaka mga blog. Kasi, yan ang unang tinitingnan ng waiter. And that determines the quality of your service. But if you're wearing diamonds, maski ano suit mo, basta diamonds, iba ang natin. Bakit masarap yung, yung, huh? bakit masarap yung pagkain doon sa Zurich? What was it? No, because in Switzerland, <coughs> they only sell the best. Walang second class. Walang second class. Yung Migros, the, yeah, yung gross, parang gross, Migros, yeah. that is the grocery yung pangmasa. Mm -hmm. Sa ngayon, ano ba ang medyo? Save more? Save more. Oh, parang save more. But the, the meats there were all very good quality. Very good quality. Iba talaga. They do not settle for second. And then when you go to the jewelry, jewelry shops, they don't sell you diamonds with, with uh, 
flawless. Everything is flawless. Kaya doon, yung Bukherer, who was the distributor of Rolex, everybody, everybody would look down on it. Because Rolex is only for the Americans. It's only for the stupid Americans. It's the word of the Swiss stupid Americans. Because they buy Rolex, which is the cheapest of all the watches. Anyway. So, ano, then later on, I said, Ay, gusto ko kumain ng alimango. Tagal-tagal na ako din ako kain ng alimango. Sige, let's go to Brittany. Diba? Sa Atlantic Ocean. Drive naman kami. Doon sa bahay ni where Bernard came from, sa Paul de Leon. Then, pagdating namin doon, but still they, I remember, July 14th. Because when we went to visit their old house, we knocked on the door, and I see the nakatira sila, Brother Lek, who turned out later, the son, when I met the Brother Lek here in Jewel Man, I said, how are you related to that Brother Lek in San Paul de Leon? So I said, that's my father. So I said, you know, I was in your house. But still day, 1962, I remember right. And the first time I saw that, ano ba yung pinakamalaki? Jeroboam ba yun? Na champagne? Ang ganyang kalaki. Malaking, malaking, malaki. The biggest of all the champagne bottles. And they were drinking there. So, pinayang. Nag-merihan na kami doon. Then they toured us the house. And then, na-shock ako. Because that was the first time I saw the house where the wife lived on a different floor from the husband. Hindi pa kasi ako nagtutour ng England noong araw eh. Pero noong sa France, first time, the husband and wife, a different floor, with a connecting staircase, and then if they want to do, you have to make an appointment. <laughs> Ganun. Ganun. Pero sa England, iba pa. Sa England, different wings ng mga bahay. And then pag nag-awi yung dalawa, kanyari, they're in the town. Right. Walang wigs. May master bed. Pag na, hindi, medyo nalasing yung lalaki or may disagreement, the husband has to sleep in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. That's why the dressing room in England always has a bed. Oh. Pero usually sa mga aristocracy, kasi I stayed in, in a castle in Ireland. My aunt married a Marquess who lived in a 280-room house, which is 100 rooms bigger than what you saw in Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey, that is uh, Carnarvon Castle, which is the house that was built by Lord Carnarvon, who financed the digging of Tutankhamen's tomb. That is only 180 rooms. The one I stayed in was 280 rooms. Pangkalamiglamig, this school. You know, they had the heater on full blast. Our bed had six blankets. Pero pagpasok mo, sisigaw ka. And then, pag ano, pag, uh, kung ano yung position mo pagpasok mo, pagising mo, napagano'n ka na, kasi napagano'n ka na home line. Because if you move, it's like going on a block of ice. So when you have to go to the bathroom, pagising mo, takpo ka sa bathroom, turn on the heater, go back to bed, na pag mainit na yung bathroom, that's when you go to the bathroom, and then you do everything wearing your woolen bata ni Bani? Bathroom. Woolen. Kasi it was so cold. And then, Lord Lord Headport would tell me, kasi we were walking in the, inside the house, and this was spring, Easter, in the winter coat. And the sun here, are you cold? You know, I have the heater on full blast. But you know, the ceiling is 20 feet high. This is why we were in the servants' quarters because the ceiling was only 20 feet high. If we were in the main house, the ceiling was 40 feet high. That's four floors in a modern building. Kaya, you know, how can you hit a 20 foot ceiling, I mean, 20 foot high bedroom? My sister would put the heater inside the, under the blanket just to keep it warm, but dangerous. Right? Uh -huh. 
Anyway, experience in Ireland was something else. Because Lord Hedford was a real word with money. Na, walang ginawa kung di kumain. That's why we got along so well. You know, he was the type who, he had a plane when he was uh, still single. And he would fly over to Deauville just to eat lunch in France. Then fly back to London in the afternoon. Then kami then, when we were living with him, talagang maganda ang you know, whatever you see in Downton Abbey, that's how we live. We have to dress up for dinner. And then we have cocktail in the drawing room. And then Lord Hedford will ask what is the menu. And then he will tell his son, the Earl, to get the wine from the cellar to fit the menu. And then when the ready, the, the housekeeper will open the door and say, dinner is served, my lord. And then we have to march by order of presidents. That's every day. Uh, lord Hedford with my wife, I with Lady Hedford, my sister with the girl. Why are you marching? We broke all. And that's every meal. And then the meals were all kind of like silver, Jordan, everything. And the plates and the, and the crystal and the cutlery was changed every meal to suit the menu. Pag-alangsal, iba ang gamit. Pag-alangsal, iba ang gamit. Pag-alangsal, iba ang gamit. Tapos, that's where I learned also how to drink. Kaya pa na sinasabi nila, drunk as a lord. Kasi ang lamig-lamig. And you know, you were, you're you're invited for tea. There's morning tea, afternoon tea. So we're invited to big, big, big houses. Tell the largest houses in Ireland. But I had a nice time because we came on a tour. He let us his car with a crest. Tapos was the uniform of the driver. And then when I want to see a house, I was like, the driver. A relation of Lady Headcourt would like to see your house. Of course, of course, come in. But it's simple, I'm a tour now, I'm a libre from the end, right? And that's the house, and they're not open to the public. What was the big thing? Iba yung thing ng Lord Edward, eh. Kasi, even when I was getting my passport, my visa, in Berks, kasi I had to bring my sister from Freiburg to the embassy. I asked, I need a visa to Ireland. What are you going to visit, to do in Ireland? I'm going to visit my aunt. I need your aunt, the Marchioness of Hedford. Oh, I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful time. Papa, Pero kung iba ka, ako ang dami talaga sa'yo. Maski dito, hindi ka makakuha ng visa to Ireland. Pero kung sinabi Lord Hedford, is the, he was the highest peer in the whole of Asia. Na, iniimbita siya ng embassy, hindi lang siya nagkukunta. Yeah. Kaya iba ang dating. Tapos, pag talaga sa England, pag aristocracy, iba talaga. Mas, maski, I remember, we came from Ireland on the plane to England. So, it's sunny. Give me your passport. So, binigay na. Pag dating namin sa England, walang postcom. So, lang, ano, yung kotse niya nandun sa baba ng aeroplano. Nandun yung, yung chapel. Hindi kami nag-immigration. Diretso. Iba talaga yung pagtingin nila sa aristocracy. Kaya yung pagtrato nila, tinawin lang kayo ang lalot na. Nagkakandara pa lahat. Iba. But at least I experienced that. Anyway, yes, Lord Head, wala rin ginawa ko kayo kung akin. And then, you know how big the... the uh, that was his smallest property na. One of the smallest. Because it's only 400 hectares. Nakaba, naka wall. And we took a tour of the estate in a Land Rover. It took us two days to see the English garden, the American garden, the Chinese garden, this garden. <laughs> it had a lake with two islands. Yung island na isa, ando na living sila. Yung parang talagang drop na ng itsura ng mga musulayo nila doon. 
Ganyan na ganyan. At ay pagpasok mo doon, akala ko na just sikla ko sa kabila ng ano. Really frightening. And then, he was formerly married to the pangalan mo. Basta, they own one of the grandest houses in Ireland. And then, Cardinal House. Ayaw naman ipakita sa aking at tiyak ko kasi siya dressed ko ang wife siya. Ay, that's ugly, that's ugly. And that's first part, the house of the family is famous. I wanted to see a joining kasi their fathers were best friends. So it was arranged and arranged. But she was a nympho. And it came to the point that her mother-in-law, the mother-in-law asked, got a, what do you call this, investigator, had her follow. She slept with 11 men in 14 days. Wow. Ganun siya ka nympho. That's why she told her son, Michael, I want you to divorce her. Mabait na mati ko ako. Di-divorce her na yung natawad niya. Pero maganda. Maganda talaga. What did you eat there? Hindi nga ako nakapunta, pero sa Ireland, maski yung, alam mo, maski yung mga Colum Bans, yung mother out of Colum Bans belong to the family of Michael. Diyan dinonate nila. Kaya she used to go to Mass in Malate. Pag nagsisimba sa Malate, naglalala nga yung pare na upuhan doon sa tabi ng altar. Si Lord Hedford. And then once I went to Baras, when I met an Irish priest, the Paris priest was Irish, I told him, Oh, you're from Ireland. You know, I was there. I was in Hedford House. Why, you know, nilabas na yung Irish whiskey na kami na doon naglaklakan because Irish whiskey is very, very good. Particularly that black bush meal and paddies. Masarap compared to yung mga Glen Fiddick na yan. Ay, iba. And you know, in Ireland, we were invited for tea several times. Yung morning tea or afternoon tea. And when you go for tea, the first thing they ask you, would you like to have whiskey, sherry, or tea? Kasi ang lamig-lamig. So, siyempre, hihingin ko whiskey. Pag binay naman sa'yo ng whiskey, goblet. Yung water goblet sa ate, puno yun. So, I learned how to drink whiskey straight by the goblet. Hindi yung yung baso yung what we use for water yun ang ginagamit nila kaya mga lasing gila you know, he gave cocktails, I remember I was there because I fixed the flowers for the gentry they used to go there every Easter kasi Lord Hedford could only stay I think 80 something days in UK otherwise he has to pay a huge tax and you know his allowance from the estate. Because we don't have to do it. It's 140,000 pounds a year. Allowance. Pang pocket money na. Yung magkano yun na time 60. Diba? Kaya dito, pag nag-withdraw yan dati, always 1,000 pounds. This was 60,000 something. Kaya pag nag-hospital siya, nakukuha ng mga and the ATM was a half a million dollars. It happened two or three times. Because it was so big, he needed two people to pull him out of the car, three people to push him. He was so big. Once he lived on me here, when he was like that, I don't know how many stones he weighed. Over 300 pounds. Pero kain pa rin ang kain. Why did he come here? Ha? Why did he come here? He married Dana Nadle, ah, okay. my auntie. Oh. Kaya Dana is Lady Hedford. Oh. And we, you know, when we, he, he had a yacht, we would go to Lubang. We had a beach house there. Tatlo kami, labing isang tripulante, and then everybody, you get served, nakagwantes. Naka silver tray lahat, maski tubig naka silver tray. And even in Luba, nag-iibang plates. Pag-almusal, pang-dealer, pang-dealer. We grew up in a house with 19 maids, 19 servants. 
That's why I was very senorita. 1970. I didn't have a tubing, but I was talking And I was really terrible as a, as a senorita. Because I, I was the eldest, no? I was the eldest, no? But we had servants who had been with us for some as long as six generations. You know, about three. Even now, our mayordomo, si Anna, is already third generation. And she's, she's 45. Oh. And we have my Lola's mayordomo. She died at 105. She was with us. She was, What's her name? I mean, the little, si Chantapia, the one who makes the bola bola. Which I, I have a lecture nga, on sa Lutong Pamana. Ay, ay, sorry, next yes. month. Yeah, that's her recipe. Oh, sarap, sarap. Oh. I remember the first time I ate camaro oh. in Palawan. I remember one of our tenants was squishing the mud. I said, ano ginagawa mo? Nagahanap ako ng suhong. Suhong. Ano yun? Sabi niya, I didn't know what it was. Then finally he caught, he got some, he showed it to me. Yun ang camaro. Oh. Susuhong in, in uh, Tagalog. No? Kamaro ay kapampanga. Anyway, he said, anong gagawin mo dyan? Kakainin, lulutuin, kakainin. So, I said, mm. So, then, nalutog niya. Tapos, tinikman ko, ay, ang sarap-sarap. Ay, akin na lang, maghanap ka na lang. <laughs> Ibubus ko yung kawawa naman. Well, I think of it. He said, nakahanap. Sa laking salibubang eh. So, I had all the maids shaking the trees. Kunin yung lahat na salibubang. And then, tanggalin lahat na ko, so diring-diri sila. Kasi wala po makain mo. Tanggalin yung mga paa, mga, mga ulo, at saka mga, mga papa. Wala alin mo yan. Lulutuin ko. You could see how they were so discussed. Pero yung niluto ko na, ginawa ko adobo. Pinatulong ko sa suka, may bawang, then primito ko with plenty of bawang. Aba, nung natikman nila, yung gusto na din nila. Pero iba yun kaysa doon sa bagong labas which you sell, you buy in the market. Kasi yung bagong labas, talagang when you eat it, it's like eating cream cheese. Bagong no? labas na ano? Na yung from the, talagang from the ground. It comes out in June, the first days of June. And then, I remember also in Palawan, pag meron yung mga tipaklong na malalaki, ha? I remember pag nahuhuli niya, sinatapong ko sa fire. Tapos pag, ano na, Di na susunog na yung mga, mga kapat. Pagunin ko yung buntot. Tapos pagkainin mo, parang itong na mga halat. Diba? Basta may malaking gana sa akin. And then I remember also, my brother, when he went there, near the house, they had what they call balud. Now, I, I don't see them anymore. But in the, in the 60s, pag dumanating yan in the afternoon, yung malalaking kawayan na ganyan, na malalaki, Umaga nun yan. Kasi they, they nest, I mean, they, they roost on the bamboo trees. So the bamboo, umaga yan. And then my brother, every morning, lalabas yan, mga sa umaga. Pagbalik niya, meron na siyang sambalot. Hindi ba tayo pedigon? Hindi ba tayo pedigon? Pellet gun. It was a good shot. Ako, hindi. And then in the afternoon, he'd do the same. He would always be sure to bring one balloon. Kasi laki ng manok yan. Pero patigas. So you can only make it into tinola or adobo. So, nagsawa rin ako. Every day, meron siyang balloon. Pero, you know, you can only eat so much tinola. <laughs> I don't even want to look at this. So that is the lifestyle now. Hindi na ako masyado makakain kasi I got sick. So, these years I have been on a constant diet because of my health. But now that I'm dialyzing, the first thing I did was buy chicharro bulakuma. <laughs> and now, I can eat everything again. So I'm in heaven <laughs> Until when? I don't know. Anyway, that's a, those are the reminiscences. I don't know what I script yet. What extemporaneous. Thank you, Sunny.